My guest right now, Motorsports Magazine, somebody who you see a lot of on the track, but maybe you haven't seen a whole lot of in front of a camera, the driver of the number one late model sportsman out of High Park, Vermont, Red Mead. Welcome to the show, Red. Thank you. Well, first things first, I know this year it's going to be a lot different from last year. Last year, this guy ran about any place there was a race going on. He'd run Airborne Saturday, load up the car, then get very little sleep. He'd be over at Grofton the next day, and that is a long trip. Yeah, that was a fun weekend because we planned on it if we didn't get wrecked here. And we uh, went home and looked at it, checked the car over, and we just decided to, let's go to Groveton. Well, that's going to really come into a lot of drivers' plans this year because the regional races at Groveton are on Sunday. So anyone who wants to run here Saturday and that regional show is going to have the same type of predicament. Uh, you're not going to be doing that a whole lot this year, though. You've cut back drastically on your racing efforts and uh, more or less just racing for fun and racing the shows that uh, you really want to be at. Yeah, we always, over the years, I've raced for fun, and uh, I think we're now going back to the fun racing deal and cutting back on here and Groveton and uh, Thunder Road all together and just pick and choose. When I feel like going on a Saturday, we're going to jump the trailer and go. Well, I know one show this guy would definitely love to be at is the Oxford 250, and who wouldn't? And uh, really, that's just a situation. Maybe getting the right equipment, and you would uh, probably pull into Oxford and try out for the big show. We've been talking about it. I'm uh, looking for basically a some kind of a sponsor or something for a motor for that show and if we can dig up you know, finances I'm gonna put my name in and try to go for it this year. Well speaking of sponsors uh, not much racing goes on without the use of sponsors so why don't we take a second you can mention to everyone who does support your racing efforts. Well, the biggest sponsor is GW Tatro Construction in Jeff and uh, Jack F Course Fuel Company in Jeff and uh, Remount Sanitation in Morseville. Now this is one of the few late model guys who have competed at Airborne Thunder Road and Groveton, and of course this year Groveton's a major part of the late mile schedule and uh, there's not a whole lot of comparison as far as airborne to the other two tracks. But with Groveton and Thunder Road, they're both short tracks. Can you compare those two at all? Uh, they're, they're pretty close. Uh, it's fun at Groveton because they've paved it. It's new asphalt down. The cars work good there. Of course Thunder Road is a, is a favorite for everybody who's running race cars and they, they seem like the Widowmaker, I guess. Well, speaking of paving, uh, rumor has it that Thunder Road will get uh, some new asphalt this year, too. Now, you've been at the track. What do you think new asphalt at Thunder Road is going to be? Is it going to increase the speeds, maybe make handling difficult, maybe a little easier? I think the cars will handle better. I think you're going to see more speed out of them. When they pave Groveton, I think they noticed more speed and better handling cars and less, less tire expense, too. Well, one thing uh, these guys also get a chance is they get to go to Sanair occasionally, and uh, Sanair is a track not even close to Groveton, Thunder Road, or Airborne. A big race track, and you get a lot of speed up there. And it's a track that you like to run out of. Would you like to see uh, maybe those one or two shows, and that's it? I like a couple of shows up there. It's fun. You have to watch the track because it can get away from you. Uh, you get relaxed a lot on the main straightaway, so you really have to pay attention. Well, Fly Tiger drivers often look up to late model guys and often end up competing against them. Well, one guy I know that he has really kept an eye on, and likewise, the guy's kept an eye on Red is Eric Williams, because, you know, Eric Williams and you have gotten along very well, and he really lives very close to you, so you more or less kept an eye on him the last couple of years, haven't you? Oh, yeah, we help him out. He brings the car across the road. To, he lives about a half mile from me, so he drives it over, and we weigh the car. And we, we help him with it and try to give him ideas so he can try what he wants, but... Just put a little bug in his ear, you know, to try this, if it'll work. Well, being the first show of the year, one difference is we've had some rain earlier today, and uh, that basically means that any of the practice yesterday, that rubber has been really washed off, and it's a pretty green racetrack out there. We also have tour cars in attendance, so when you go out there, it's a situation where the car is probably not quite the same as you would hope for it from your original setup, and to so some you can, can pretty much uh, fix in the pits? Yeah, you have to adjust it a little bit after the tour puts down the rubber, and uh, the Tigers run a little softer compound, so the, the tires make a difference on the track, and it'll make our cars maybe a little loose. You just have to adjust it as you go. But well, we know, like he said, he's not going to be running a whole lot this year. Some selected races, so how about a goal for 94? Uh, any one or two big races besides, obviously, the 250 you'd love to pull in victory lane on? Oh, I think any of those 100 lappers would be good. All right, I want to thank my guests for joining me. Out of Hyde Park, Vermont, the driver of the number one late-mile sportsman. Keep an eye on him. He'll be here a couple of times. Red me. Thanks, Red. Thank you very much.
Joining me right now, Motorsports Magazine, a face very familiar to our viewers. He drives, or I should say used to drive, the 14 Fly Tiger, but you won't see him out there this year in that division. He had jumped into the late models, has a beautiful black number 12 machine, namely because Phil Scott has 14. I want to welcome my guest, Chet Devarney Jr. Welcome to the show again, Chet. Uh, thank you very much. Well, like I said, uh, your old familiar 14's gone by the wayside because Phil Scott obviously had already acquired that number, but nice looking number 12 machine. A lot different than the Tiger though, isn't it? Oh yeah, I mean everything on them is different. We uh, we bought the car from Dennis Demers this this past winter here, and uh, they've been really great helping us get it set up. And uh, even today, you know, they've helped us give us some hints and everything. And uh, it should be a big change, but hopefully we'll just have fun this year. Well, one thing he is going to be trying to do and attempting to do is get to the big show, the 250 at Oxford. And, of course, regional races play a crucial part in that. Before we go any further, I should tell you, uh, he's not going to be here quite as much as you might like to see him because he's going to be running, I know, Riverside a lot. But he'll be for all, be here for all those regional shows. And 100 laps, that's not something you're used to. Oh, no, it's a lot different. And, uh, we're not really aiming for Oxford. To tell you the truth, we got our tickets. We're sitting right on the uh, start finish line, so that's how that's how we're going this year. And uh, you know, we're just hoping to qualify for some of these regional races, get some seat time, and try to gain some respect from these other guys out here. Now you mean to tell me, if you won one of those qualifiers, uh, you would trade in that that seat time ticket in the stands for one in the car? Well, you know, we might have to try to make some changes then, but uh, we're not we're not really hoping, you know. To, to win everything this year, of course, but you know, we just want to go out there and just at least try to gain some respect and try not to crash anybody out there. Well, let's talk about the late model division because if the Tigers weren't competitive enough, you're jumping into a very strong field of drivers. Just here at Airborne, you can name a, a half dozen, but Riverside, it's the same basic thing. A lot of top drivers over there, and being that you're not as familiar with the cars, a situation where you get to take three, four races and a learning curve type thing, maybe tag behind a couple of the big names, follow their lines, or you pretty much got an idea how you want to drive it. Oh no, we've been following people. We came here last week, ran practice, and even today I was talking to Red Mead, you know, and Brent Dragon, and those guys. You know, that's all I've been doing is talking and talking with them. You know, and the Flying Tigers, that's what we used to do. Talk to Steve Renadette and Mark Lehrman and figure out how they went around and try to learn from them. Well, Steve Renadette is back in his division as Renadette's been with the late models for one year. This is his second. But uh, you have another familiar fate joining you in the rookie ranks. Ron Weston kind of jumped up the ranks with you. And uh, so you haven't shook that 35 yet. You're still going to be battling with them. Oh, yeah, him and Robin Wood over here. And uh, it's going to be a lot of fun, actually. You know, the good part about it is, is you know, we've all raced with each other before. And I'm, I don't have any doubt that we can race with each other here until. Uh, let's talk about Thunder Road for a second because rumor has it we're going to get some new asphalt down there. And I talked to Red Meat earlier, and he said probably get a little quicker for these cars. Uh, you got the same idea? You think it'll be quicker? You think it's going to take a while to adapt to it? I think it's going to be quicker, and uh, it probably will take a while to get adapted to it. And uh, you know, it was like Groveton last year over there at Riverside. It was like that. We brought our Tiger car up there, and we had a lot of fun. And I think Thunder Road will be really fast this year, and uh, it's very competitive over there. Probably more than here, just because it's such a smaller track. You can't qualify as many cars, but I think it'll be a lot of fun. Well, this late mile division every year it seems to grow bigger and bigger. And one thing that Tom Curley's looking forward to is maybe expanding out to some new tracks for this division. I have a feeling you would love to go to some new speedways and try your hand. Well, I'd love to, and uh, we're hoping within you know, three or four years, maybe we could try to venture out a little bit, you know, like Gene Palacier is doing this year, and, uh, you know, I'm sure a guy like him who's young, he's got a lot of a lot of talent, he'll do really well, and, uh, you know, hopefully within three or four years, maybe we can start doing something like that. Well, how about following guys like Kip Stockwell and Dennis Demers and joining the ACT, something you look forward to? Oh, I'd love to, and uh, I'd love to race with those guys. And, uh, you know, we got some pretty good sponsors this year again. We know the Northeast Pageant, and also we just got Vermont Teddy Bear to help us out this year, and uh, hopefully we can build with them and they can move up along with us. Well, we may have lost him on weekly Saturday night shows from our Fly Tiger Division, but when the regionals are in town, and the first four races, for that matter, here at Airborne this season, keep an eye on the number 12 late mile. He's a rookie in the division, but some tells me he's not going to get many rookie finishes. Look for him to be real strong this year. Thanks for joining me, chat. Well, thank you.
Well, the American Can Canadian Tour only joins us a couple of times each year, so we don't get a whole lot of opportunity to talk to these guys. So when I see one standing around doing nothing, can't miss the opportunity. Joining me right now, the driver of the number 15 ACT automobile, and a driver that a lot of people keep a close eye on wherever he races, Derek Lynch. Welcome to the show, Derek. Thank you very much. Nice to be here. Well, let's get the, the formalities out of the way. A brand new, really a brand new team pretty much, brand new car and sponsor this year. Why don't you give everyone the information? Okay, yeah, we've uh, cut a new deal with a guy, his name is Jerry Hicks, and he has a car, and it's stationed in Maine, and a guy by the name of Carl Marcotte looks after it during the week. We're going to campaign that car um, in all the Maine regional shows, as well as the, uh, the Maine and New Hampshire tour shows. Uh, we've got my own car at home in Ontario, in Norwood, um, that myself and my existing crew from before maintain, and we'll run it in the Ontario regional shows and most of the Thunder Road and uh, Airborne shows. Uh, we had a new new people come on board. Wagner Entertainment Enterprises is the new sponsor for the car, and uh, Jerry Truck Service. And uh, I think we're gonna have a good year. We got two real good cars and uh, two good crews, you know, on both ends of the spectrum. So I think we're in for a good time. Now, one thing he didn't like here and came out about a month ago when all but one of the Canadian portion races of the American Canadian Tour for '94 were canceled, and he didn't like that because being in Norwood, Ontario. He was close to a few of those tracks, but now a lot of traveling facing you for 94. Yeah, we it really hurt us bad. Uh, all our sponsorship comes from the Canadian side of the border, um, and it was good because we had the Cayuga and the Mossport and the Delaware and, and Flamborough markets that were close to Toronto, and that's a big area for us. Um, it hurts, you know. The only good thing about it is with our, our situation with Jerry Hicks right now, his car being in Maine, it's going to save us from towing our car all over the country. You know, it'll cut down that much travel and we can just get in the car and drive down. So that's good, but, uh, you know, the Mossport trip certainly made up for the long runs to Beach Ridge, that's for sure. But we'll, we'll persevere and carry on. Well, he has come all so close to picking up that elusive first checker. A couple of years ago, came out of turn four. LePage on the outside nipped him at the wire. He he had no problems about that. He figured, figured finishing second at Kevin was nothing to worry about. But he has had a checker flag in his career. It happened a couple of years ago at Savile Beach Speedway. But it was a combination show, like the Milk Bowl. It was two segments. But you won the first segment. That must have been a thrill. Yeah, we had a real good run. We won the first segment by half a straightaway. The car was going good and uh, getting into trouble in the second one. And... It was just, you know, a, a real good case of uh, no experience on my behalf, and I made a mistake. It's one of them things, but uh, we're in a real good position this year, and uh, I'm hoping we can pick up a checkered flag or two and have a real good run at the points, I hope. we got some good runs here at Airborne. Do you figure maybe today is the day for that first win? You have a lot of racing ahead of you, a lot of tracks you do well at, but Airborne is one of the ones you've had some good runs at. Yeah, we've had exceptional luck at Airborne. Um, I'm looking for a real good day. You know, Ralph's going to be strong, Brad's strong, Tracy's strong, a lot of good guys here today. If we can run in the top two or three all day long, you know, I'm going to be real happy. But we're definitely looking for that win. We're hungry this year, and I think we've got the equipment to do it. Well, with the demise of a lot of the Canadian tracks and racing primarily in the U.S. portion, uh, any special tracks come to mind you wish you could get maybe a little more often tracks you really love to drive at? I like it here. Like you said, we've had some good runs here. I really enjoy racing here. Um, I'm hoping that we're going to be able to get to Cayuga back home a couple of times. I like running there, and I'm real glad they kept the Sonera race. I especially enjoy racing at Sonera. So I think we're going to have a good summer. We'll get lots of racing in, and uh, hopefully we'll stay out of trouble and end up good in all the point chases. A uh, question I've asked a couple of late model guys, because they run Thunder Road every week, is uh, they're going to be repaving the place. And they think it's going to be quicker. Well, if it's going to be quicker for the lay models, you guys are going to be supersonic out there. Is there anything to worry about? Or you think, yeah, we'll, we'll deal with it? I don't think so. Uh, Thunder Road is a tight place, but it's great for the fans. And the fans is what it's all about, you know. If they repave the place, it's going to be fast, and I think it's going to make for real good racing. You know, it'll be, it's two grooves there now, but there'll be, there'll be two and a half grooves. I mean, you'll be able to get hooked up anywhere. So I'm looking forward to it. I think it's, it's well overdue. Well, a lot of the tour guys feel that uh, certain tracks they wish they could get more laps on, or at least more laps in a feature race. Now, the last race of the season here is a 300-lap event. Would you like to see more long-distance races, or you figure they're just about the right distance for you? I think they're just about the perfect distance. 150, 200-lap races, they're the best distance races. They're long enough that a possible pit stop can play a factor, um, but for the guys trying to economize, you can go the whole way on one set of tires. It's, you know, if you can't decide it in 150 laps, Everything else is just an endurance test, you know, so I like the length of our races and the 250 and the 300, you know, they give the guys in the pit stops a chance to show their stuff, so it's good for everybody. Well, the main regional series that you've been a part of is a situation where you get to run against a lot of guys who run primarily in Maine. 
And that brings up the point of the Astro 250 because if anybody knows the track, it's the guys from Maine. Now, running that division or that regional series, you're, you're getting a good look at these guys. Anyone out there impress you as maybe there could be a surprise this year? Oh, there's a lot of them. I mean, guys like Dave Dion that only run part-time, he's going to be a real factor over there. Stan Meserve's going to run it, you know, now that he's not the tech man on the ACT Tour anymore. Um, most of the guys from Beach Ridge, Mike Maeda, the Johnson brothers, I mean, a lot of good races over there. And Jeff Taylor, after his win opening day, Dale Shaw, them guys are going to be real strong. So, yeah, we, we're not, you know, wiping them off the slate at all. They're going to be there. They're going to be a factor. But uh, I think we can run with them. You know, we showed that the first race at Oxford. We ended up fourth behind two track champions and Ralph Mason, you know, a longtime veteran of Maine. So I feel confident. I think we got a good shot. Well, while we're here at Airborne, another quick question around this half-mile track is, last couple of races there seemed to have been maybe a few more flat tires than normal. And it was odd because a lot of the tour drivers didn't think that would be a problem. Do you think it was a fluke, or is it track in it where maybe if you run a little too long on the tires, they give out real quick? Uh, in all honesty, I think it's more of a coincidental fluke type deal. I don't, the, the track over here at Airborne has always been a little bit on the rough side, uh, you know, just due to the way it was kind of put together and this and that. I, I don't think the track surface itself has any, you know, is really abrasive or anything like that on the tires. In all honesty, Airborne is one of the best places we race at as far as uh, raceability. I mean, you can run two cars wide, up and down both straightaways through the turns. It's a, it's a real nice place to race, and uh, it's fast enough that, you know, you get this roller running on a half mile, so it's a, it's a nice place. Well, if you do have a flat tire this place, you have a good pit system. You can get in and out of the pits real easy. But it happens at a place like Thunder Road, you might as well hang it up because you're down at least three or four laps. The pits here work out well for you? Yeah, the pit road's a good deal. You know, it's nice when they pick up right off the back stretch and, and re-enter on the back stretch, just like a small oval in the infield. It's the best. You know, you don't have to worry about somebody up the inside and this and that trying to get in the pits. So it's a good setup, and, uh, you know, I think we'll be in good shape. Well, as you take a look at Derek's crew getting the Wagner 15 prepared for racing a little bit later, I want to thank my guests for joining me out of Northwood, Ontario, a definite contender for the ACT point title. And I'll tell you what, keep an eye on him because this is a great track for him. Thanks for joining me, Derek. Thank you very much. You guys have a good day. Joining me right now, Motorsports Magazine, while well, I have the opportunity, because he travels all over the place, obviously, one of the leading members of the American Canadian Tour, the driver of the number 10 machine, Ralph Mason out of Maine. Welcome to the show, Ralph. Good. Yeah, we're glad to be up here. Uh, we hope the weather straightens out today. Uh, Jim Salad Dodge was running pretty good in practice yesterday, so we're hoping that it's going to run good today. Well, I'll tell you what, Ralph's been running good this year. Uh, two races under his belt. He has a second-place finish to Jeff Taylor, which is nothing to worry about, and a victory just last week of the Regional Series. So you've been right up front all season long so far, and this being a track you do exceptionally well at, you're a definite favorite to maybe pick up your second victory today. <laughs> I don't know about that. I know that uh, we like this racetrack, the car likes this racetrack, and it's the same car as we used here last year, so, you know, it's dialed in pretty good shape. Well, let's talk about some of your competition because a couple of guys have left the division, but nobody is going to give anyone eight there on a silver platter. There are certainly many drivers here who can win at any of the tracks you guys run at. Besides yourself, Beaver's always a threat. Derek Lynch, uh, hard to believe he hasn't won a race. The guy always seems to run good, and several others. Is there some that uh, you're very aware of out there that you, you really like to try to keep the certain guys far behind you because you know that they're a major threat, or uh, you pretty much like to run maybe second and get them in the last couple laps? Well... We kind of like to, the way we like to really run is to run, you know, out front because there's points in the lead in the most laps, but uh, it really doesn't bother us to run in the pack, you know, in the first four or five. Uh, then, uh, you know, if you got tires left, then you can make it, you know, make it in the last 20 laps or so to the front. But we've got uh, the competition in our uh, ACT this year is really tightened up. we got uh, any one of six or seven of these guys that can win any time. Well, you don't have to travel as much as you thought you would because about a month ago, the demise of most of the Canadian races on this series, with the exception of Sinair, which for you is not very far at all. So uh, since your traveling has been cut down a bit, I know you're running the regional series. Maybe uh, going to pick up another race someplace along the way if you get an off week, which highly unlikely? Uh, it's not very likely. Uh, with the regionals and what we have in ACT Tour Racing, you know, that's 22 races, and that's... And there's quite a lot of engine changing back and forth between the Pro Stock engine and the 9-to-1 uh, engine, so we've got our hands pretty full with 22. 
Any tracks stand out now that uh, most of the Canadian tracks are gone? Any tracks stand out as one that you're really looking forward to ending up in victory lane besides Airborne? Uh, no, we like to be in victory lane in all of them. You know, we know that's not possible, but uh, we're certainly trying our best, and we've got a good crew, and I think that, uh, you know, when it's all said and done, we're going to be pretty tough all year. Uh, let's talk about a couple of the guys who have been running with you. Uh, the first two races of the season, the same three guys have been up front. It's been Ralph, Jeff Taylor, and Tracy Gordon. Now, Tracy runs with you on the tour. Jeff is a selected driver, mainly in Maine for the tour. But, uh, you know, a lot of the people around here haven't heard these names as much. But you from Maine, you run against these guys. Maine is a strong area to find some top drivers, isn't it? It sure is. Those two guys you mentioned are tough. There's no question about it. Probably they're as tough as they come, especially uh, at Beach Ridge and Oxford and Unity. And uh, up here on this racetrack, it's a little bit different. But when you get on those little round places and you got to handle real good, those guys got a ton of experience and they really get around them. Yeah, little places is a key word there because most of the tracks you run at aren't that big. Airborne being a half mile, one of the longer ones you get. Uh, do you prefer a longer track? Do you like the short tracks, the bull rings as you will, where you more or less have to muscle your way around? Yeah, I think that I like those. Uh, I like the little shot bull rings because we uh, we get a chance to really, uh, you know, uh, moose the car around, have a good time with it. The, uh, you know, it's good for me, but it's hard on the body and fenders and stuff like that. Uh, I'd have to say that uh, the more we race and the older I get, uh, I guess probably the bigger places are a little easier. We don't have quite so much work when we go home, but, but the little bull rings are a lot more fun. Well, earlier today we had a lot of rain in the track, and it's clearing up now, but for a while it looked like maybe we'd have some problems with Mother Nature. Is that discouraging to a driver? You haul all the way to a track, get some good practice times in, get the car set up just the way you want, and then you have to come back some other time because Mother Nature canceled it. Yeah, well, there isn't anything we can do about that, for, you know. So, I mean, you just got to kind of grin and bear it. Uh, you got to, we get pumped up for the race before we leave home, and we stay pumped up until it's called, and then we try to, you know, try to calm down a little bit. But we're pretty pumped up about today. I think the weather's straightening out, and I think we're going to get a good race. Uh, let's talk again about the regional series because it's something new this year that uh, really Maine is, is one of the strong areas, but Division Three I thought looked pretty good. It's a lot of longer tracks, and if you could travel out there, would Division Three interest you at all? Yeah, Division Three would really interest me, but uh, it's 10 hours from home, so, you know, so, but the tracks are bigger and you got a chance. That way, if you're running Division Three, you don't have to be changing the engine back and forth, you know, so that's, that's a big plus, and that takes, you know, eight hours, so, uh, but the difference is in, you know, basically in the financial end of it, you can't, it, it pays the same, but it pays in Canadian funds, and, uh, you know, so that hurts it pretty bad, and uh, plus the traveling, it costs a lot to travel, plus the motel, so I guess we're going to stick to the uh, Region 1. I need to thank my guests for joining me. The driver of the number 10 ACT automobile, a very strong car, especially when he's here in Plattsburgh. Rapid Ralph Mason, thanks for joining me, Ralph. Oh, thanks a lot. We're going to give a hell today in that Dodge. Don't get to see him nearly enough. The driver of the number 12 machine all the way from Ottawa, Ontario, Leo Poirier. Welcome to the show, Leo. Thank you very much. Well, I said he's from Ottawa, which should be your first clue since they have a great track there, Ottawa Speedway, that he's probably run there. Yeah, he's run there. He's won the 87 late model championship, which is a great thrill. Good way to jump into ACT racing. Yeah, good experience in Ottawa. And uh, nice now I got a uh, ride with the team from Quebec City from that experience. Hey, let's talk about your team for a minute, because I know it's a new car, new setup altogether, and something you're still trying to get maybe a little bit used to. Yeah, that's right. That's our second time out this year with the car. And uh, we ran Oxford last week. It ran pretty good. And uh, today we're doing good times, and I hope we be right up there in the race. Well, let's talk about uh, some of the tracks you run at, because you've run a lot of ACT races, so you've seen a lot of the tracks. Uh, you've been here at Airborne. Anything special about this half mile uh, that you really like? Yeah, quick race and... Uh, Second, two grooves, and the uh, track goes pretty well. But when you looked at your schedule this year, you saw some racing uh, a little bit west of you, like over near Cayuga and that, but uh, it's all gone now. And basically, you're in the U.S. with the exception of Sanair, which is a very large track, to say the least. I'm sure you're going to like getting back there, but uh, kind of sorry to see some of those Canadian races canceled. Yeah, it is. Uh, they say that we got recession up there, and uh, like now we got to come all the way down to the U.S. and, and uh, compete with all them guys. 
We still got Canadian racing up there, and uh, we got one in Ottawa, one in Air, and uh, I hope we Ottawa uh, Canadian race coming back all over again. Yeah, a lot of people forget that. If you look at the American Canadian Tour, the word is Canadian. They have a great division with cast car up there and a lot of little tracks, and uh, a lot of very good drivers come out of Canada. So it's, you always seem to have, wherever you race, very good competition. So getting in this division was nothing new. You knew it would be a good division. Yeah, we knew that, but... Uh, like the one uh, Cascar is on uh, Ottawa right now, and a lot of good drivers come out of Cascar, and a lot of Cascar drivers are here, and uh, they're a really good driver, and uh, I hope they keeps up like this. Well, let's talk the difference. Uh, Sanair being a huge trial, Airborne being a half mile, you get a lot of little tiny quarter mile tracks thrown in. Any one that you really like better than the others? Well, uh, Airborne's uh, it's one one of the best ones right here. Uh, Barry, it's kind of hard to qualify because they got so many cars out there for a quarter mile, and uh, you really got to put yourself into it if you want to qualify in, uh, in Barry. San Air, San Air, super speedway, greatest Canadian track ever built, and I wish they had more races out there because you could really fly. A lot of people wish. I love going up to San Air. Uh, you said it's tough to qualify. You want to have talk tough to qualify. You talk about the Oxford 250. I know you're heading to Oxford, but you know most drivers go there not hoping to win. They just hope to make the final. That's right. Uh, when you go to Oxford, you got 100, 118 cars. You're just, uh, they pick 40 some cars out of the pack. And uh, so far, we've been lucky. We've been qualifying two years in a row. And uh, I hope this year's the same. We've just got to hope to finish the race this year. Well, 150 laps here at Airborne Face you in a couple of hours. Is there a certain type of philosophy you have going into the track? Do you figure, well, I got to get to the front, or do you figure, well, by the halfway point, I want to be in the top 10? Do you have some sort of strategy heading in? Well, like you tr first of all, after the race, you try to get away from all accident or so. And uh, if you could keep up on the lead lap after race, then you start really racing for the going on the front. It's just to keep out of the, uh, of the wrecks and everything else, and then you'll be okay. And the problem with a half-miler is when there is an accident, you're going quick enough, sometimes you can't avoid them, and that's what really hurts. That's right. Uh, when a half-mile, you don't have many chances. You just need somebody else going on the radio to help you out when there's kind of an accident like this to get out of there. I'm glad you talked about the radio. A lot of people forget these guys do have radio hookups, and it really does help because you can't see the whole track. If you're up in three and a couple of guys tangle just short of turn one, you may not know it until you get to the stripe, and by then, track may be blocked. If they tell you coming out of four, you have plenty of time to avoid it. Exactly. That's why we got a spotter in the, in the stand, and he's just like a co-pilot for us. And uh, if he's sleeping on the job, well, we could... Uh, kind of uh, had a bad wreck and if he's on the job well we save a lot of accidents that's that helps us a lot well we mentioned some of the tracks you race at uh, how about giving us your favorite would it be airborne or again you know you don't have to pick an act track because i know you love ottawa yeah my ottawa is still my favorite track i won championship there in 87 and uh we're going uh, last time i went there was in 87 and we opened to go back in 94 we got one race there on june 11 and i hope to go back in their own track and see what's going on. Well, one track that got uh, tossed by the wayside was going to be a new track with Santa Stash. I don't know if you ever ran Santa Stash, but have you ever been there? Well, I've been there, but uh, now he's a new owner, and uh, now what's going on, uh, we, we were on the St. Croix circuit, and there, we're going there twice this year, so we'll see what's going on. Well, that was my question. It's one of those tracks that uh, if you get an off week, a lot of drivers like to travel up there. It seems to be a nice little track. Yeah, it is. It's just about like a little bit bigger than Barry, but quick crack, not much place to go, and you got to be woke up on the track. you got to watch where you're going. In case you know, Senate staff just a little bit north of Montreal. That's why I picked that. A lot of people do go up there. Uh, let's talk about some of your competition. You mentioned that a lot of guys came out of Cascar, which is a, it's like the NASCAR division. Uh, it's a great little Canadian series. But, you know, a couple of guys, like Junior Hanley and Kevin LePage, have ventured out this year. And everyone said, well, that's going to open up the division. But there's no big favor. There's many guys who could, could win any of the races. Oh, for sure. Like, we got Brad Leighton, and then we got Beaver Dragon, and uh, Nason, and, uh, uh, like, anybody could run this race. Like, all the cars, right now, everybody's got pretty much the same cars, and, like, uh, you just got to be in there. Like, uh, you got to be lucky and finish the race. That's what you need. Now, race drivers have one of two philosophies. They either want to be leading when the white, la white flag falls, or they want to be running second to make that last second move. Which are you? Do you like to be leading when the white falls? Do you want to be right on the leader's bumper? On a short track like this, you sure want to lead the race because you don't want to be second because it's pretty hard to, to pass somebody. you got to be real locked up if you want to do that. Finishing second never feels good. It does. About a week later, we say, hey, I, I finished second. But, boy, right after the race, you say, what could I have done to win that thing? 
Yeah, you're always trying. Every week you're coming back and you want to try hard and try hard. And sometimes it doesn't work always like that. So you, you keep winning and uh, you want to win, but sometimes you're not there. So this year I hope it's their season to go. I want to thank my guests for joining me. The white and orange colored number 12 machine out of Ottawa, Ontario. Big name of the ACT, Leo Poirier. Thanks for joining me, Leo. Thank you very much. Nice to meet you. Week number one of Motorsports Magazine set to kick off. Rob Knowles and Steve Hayes back at Airborne to bring you all the action from week number one. And Steve... It's always interesting and it's always exciting to get the season kicked off. Oh, absolutely, and of course uh, we also have the tour in town, so we figure there's going to be a little bit more excitement than normal, but uh, I think our regular three divisions will, will give us enough. Coming up on this evening's program, we have highlights from the late model sportsmen, Flying Tigers, and the street stocks, as well as interviews with several of the drivers from the American Canadian Tour, along with a couple of interviews, uh, drivers in the late model sportsman division. Yeah, Red Mead and Chad Devarney Jr. were nice enough to come over and talk to me for a while, and they both have opposite plans for this year. One wants to run pretty much as much as he can, and the other's cutting back drastically in his racing efforts. Steve, uh... The car counts for this afternoon appear to be fairly solid, uh, about an average turnout. And a lot of good names in the pits, too, so you figure with the first week here and maybe some car chassis not set up the way the drivers would like them, probably going to get some real excitement in just the qualifiers alone. And as you mentioned, it's the first appearance for the American Canadian Tour here at Airborne this season. The first of four appearances, uh, Airborne will host uh, the greatest number of American Canadian Tour events this year. Yeah, and we have a couple of our late model guys who have jumped ship into the Tour, most notably uh, Mark Lamphere and Jean-Paul Sears, so they're maybe testing the waters a little too early. You got a good shot of the sky as our cameraman was asleep. And uh, speaking of the sky, a little bit delayed in uh, practice time this morning. Uh, not a lot of practice for the drivers because we did have rain in the area, but it appears the rain has uh, gone away and we will not have to deal with weather this afternoon. And one good thing is during the practice session when they finally got it underway, not a whole lot of spinning on the track, so I think traction will be fine for our cars today, but uh, of course, you know, when that green flag drops in actual competition, anything goes. You get a shot of the pits as well as our cameraman's finger. <laughs> See, uh, looks over there. Boy, he's really having a tough time on the camera this afternoon as we get ready for the first week of races. Uh, and again, coming up on the program, interviews with uh, the late model drivers who you mentioned, as well as some interviews with the American Canadian Tour drivers. Well, yeah, you know, when the ACT is in town, you got to get a couple of them. And I uh, had a chance to talk with uh, Ralph Nace and Derek Lynch and Leah Poirier, which probably doesn't get a whole lot of, uh, of notoriety around these parts. All right, so we have a lot to look forward to. It's week number one at Airborne, and Rob Knowles and Steve Hayes here to bring you all of the action. Stay with us, Motorsports Magazine. Coming up first, the interviews, and then we'll have highlights from the three local divisions. Heat number one for the late model sportsman. A lot of new cars, a lot of work put into these cars over the winter, and on the pole is the 48 of Gwen Wright. Outside the 40 of Dwayne Lanphier, row two, the 11, that's Tom Tiller. And outside of Tom Tiller, the 9, Danny Bridges, this year piloting a Lumina. Back to row three, another familiar face, the 66, Joe Thomas. Outside Joe, the zero of Brent Dragon, that's a sharp car. There's Ronnie Weston in the 35, up from the Flying Tigers, outside the 68 of Jim Silly. And shotgun on the field is Ron Lamell in what used to be Danny Bridges' fourth Thunderbird last year. Lamell will pilot the 11 New York. So we have two 11s in the field. Tom Tiller in the yellow familiar number 11. And Ron Lamell at the rear of the field. Good field of cars here, Steve Hayes, for the first heat of the season. I'll tell you, this is a terrific one to get everything kicked off. Some great drivers. They come down out of turn four, looking for the green flag, and we're in the way. Good jump from the outside for Dwayne Lanfear. Danny Bridges looks to get around Glenn Wright. Wright a little bit loose. Three wide down the back stretch. Battle for third. Look at Brent Dragon on the outside as he works high through turn four down the front stretch. Leading the first lap is Dwayne Lanfear. It's Lanfear, then Bridges, third Brent Dragon, Glenn Wright fourth, fifth to Tom Tiller, and Ronnie Weston makes a move underneath Joe Thomas for sixth. 
They freight train out of four, and it's still Dwayne Lanfear. Brent Dragon looks to make a move for the second spot around Danny Bridges as they head down the back stretch. And it's Dragon and Bridges side by side, heading into three. Dragon on the outside, Bridges on the inside, down to the stripe, and it's going to be Dragon. Brent Dragon is on the move here, looking to pick up a win in the feature. He's up to second and now looks to dispense of Dwayne Lanfear as he marches towards the front. Side by side, down the front stretch at the line, it's still Lanfear. But how long can the Marshville Vermont driver hold off Brent Dragon? Danny Bridges third, Glenn Wright with a solid fourth. Fifth, Tom Tiller, Ronnie Weston, sixth, as it starts to sprinkle here at Airborne. Still side by side, Landfair, Dragon, Danny Bridges comes back on the inside, looking to stick a nose underneath for second. Great battle at the front, first heat of 1994 for the late model sportsman. They come down the front stretch, it is Landfair and Bridges looking to make a move underneath. The zero of Brent Dragon. Attitude down the back stretch, and it is Danny Bridges into second. Now side by side, Dragon fights back. And Bridges looks to move underneath Lanfair. He gets sideways. And what action we've had from these front three cars. Lanfair, Dragon, Bridges, Dragon now on the outside making a run. Side by side down the front stretch, it's Dragon. Brent Dragon to the front. Eight laps down. And now Brent Dragon looks to run away from Dwayne Lanfear and Danny Bridges. White flag will fly this time. Look at Ron Weston challenging for the third spot on the outside. Gets a little bit loose, and he might pay for that as Glenn Wright moves underneath to challenge for fourth. Great battle in the middle of the pack. They come down for the checkered flag. It's going to be Brent Dragon. Battle for second. Land Fair. Very close call for third. Steve Hayes uh, not exactly sure who they're going to give third place to. How'd you see it? I really couldn't tell. It was very close, but you know, I would have heard about a two-groove racetrack. You saw it work to perfection by Brent Dragon. Eight laps in groove number two before he took the lead, and once he did, he pulled away. Surprise, though. The 68 of Jim Silly, extremely loose. He'll have to work on that car. And how about rookie Ron Weston? All right, so the first heat is finished, 1994, and it goes to the zero of Brent Dragon. Stand by for heat number two. Heat number two for the late model sportsman on the speedway. Tony Poisson on the pole. Jim Barton on the outside. Steve Hayes, we remember Jim Barton in a, probably the worst wreck or crash last year at uh, Airborne. Destroyed the car, but he's back. Row two has got Billy Fountain, the 91. Dave Whitcomb as well in this race, the runner great. Also look for the 36 of Scott Carpenter. The 5 of Pat Corbett, 12 of Chet DeVarney Jr. Look at Billy Fountain on the inside. Fountain shoots to the front, to the inside of Poisson. Carpenter second. As they come in a four down, second plate to left. It's Fountain. Scott Carpenter second. Third to Pat Corbett. Down the back stretch, the defending champion in the 36 looks to make a move on the inside. They come out of four and it's going to be Billy Fountain. Field strung out, it's Fountain. The 36, Carpenter. The 5 of Corbett. And then the 25 of Dave Whitcomb. Back 
stretch. Scott Carpenter looking to find racing room to make a move on Billy Fountain. for the third spot, the 25 of Dave Whitcomb as he looks to move around the five of Pat Corbett. Whitcomb looks to the high side into turn three. Yeah. As you watch these four cars battle at the front of the pack, there's another group of four. Tony Poisson, Rick LeQueer in the 10 from Plattsburgh. The 10 of Chet Devarney and Jimmy Barton battling in the back four spot. Now back to the front. And still they freight train around the track. It is Billy Fountain, Scott Corbett, Pat Corbett, and Dave Whitcomb. Challenge for the third spot again. Dave Whitcomb looks to the outside. But it is definitely not the fast lane here at Airborne as Whitcomb has tried several times to move around Pat Corbin and has been unsuccessful each time. There's a good look at the 91, Billy Fountain coming out of four. He's led all the way in this second heat. Made a pass, first left pass to the back front to put him in the lead and he's held on to it. Carpenter has not been able to mount a serious challenge to found white flag going to fly this time by. Dave Whitcomb still on the back bumper of Pat Corbett. That's for third. Let's see if Scott Carpenter has anything left for Billy, for Billy Fountain. Found a very impressive start here in heat number two, 1994 season. First heat victory for Billy Fountain. Second is Scott Carpenter. Third to Pat Corbett. Fourth to Dave Whitcomb. Fifth, the 42 of Tony Poisson. Ricky Laquier, sixth, Jim Barton, seventh. And Chet DeVarney, an eighth place finish for the rookie. I'm not sure what happened to Chet. Uh, that card was very loose. But I'll tell you what, Wild Bill made a great move the first lap of the race, going three wide, got to the front, and then after that kept the defending late mile sportsman champ in second and Billy with a great job the first New Yorker to pick up the checker flag this year and I got to feel he has a lot more set in store for him this year. All right two heats in the books. Heat number two the victory goes to the 91 of Plattsburgh's Bill Fountain. Heat number three for the late model sportsman set to roll and on the pole is the 75 of Peter Fecto. Outside, popular local driver from Plattsburgh, Buck O'Branham in the 63. Man you saw interviewed earlier in the one, Red Mead, outside the 76, it's Steve Renadette. Doug Hoare goes in the 46, outside, a driver from Riverside Speedway in Groveton, New Hampshire, Stacy Cahoon. The 6, Steve Hayes, refresh my memory. Uh, as I recall, that 6 machine rookie, Ron Weed. Ron Weed and another rookie on the outside, that's Robin Wood in the 61. They come down, green is out. Side by side into one, good battle. Fecto on the inside, Branham on the outside. Fecto starts to pull away down the back stretch. And Branham looks to answer. Side by side as well for third. They come down to complete the first lap. Peter Fecto by an O. Buckle Branham looks to the outside, gets a little bit loose. And looking to the inside of Branham for second is the 76 of Steve Renadette. Renadette into the second spot. Branham trying to make that outside groove work. Red Mead looking to capitalize on any mistake for the third spot. There's Steve Renata in the 76, trailing the 75 of Peter Fecto. Again, Branham stuck out on the outside. Red Mead looks to move underneath for third as they come out of two. Side by side battle for the third spot. Mead on the inside, Branham outside, and look at Doug Orr move up suddenly to challenge for third. Meanwhile, they're side by side for the top spot. Down to the wire, it's going to be Steve Renadet taking over the lead. It's Renadet, then Facto, or Fecto rather. Red Mead in third. He's looking to move into second as he looks to the inside of Peter Fecto. 
Jack Jam for the second spot. Brennan is slowly pulling away. We'll look at here for second. It is Specto. Red Mead and Bucko Branham looking to challenge for second. Branham falls off the pace. Doug Orr moves underneath. Orr in the Dodge Intrepid looking to make a move on the outside. Red Mead looks to move underneath Peter Fecto again. They're side by side. Two rows of cars there. This is for second. They look to go three wide. Four wisely backs off. Steve Rennett is checking out on the field as they battle here for second. It's still Red Mead in second. Buck O'Branham third. Fourth, Peter Fecto, Stacy Cahoon, and Doug Hoare battle for fifth. Two to go for Steve Renadette. Red Mead showing smoke. Mead is loose. He's putting oil down on the track, no doubt about it. As we have uh, tandem pirouettes. Look out, you better slow down. Steve Hayes, Red Mead must have put something down on the track because we had tandem spins. Oh, absolutely. Me loses it right behind him. Bucko Brandon, then one of the Riverside Path champs, Stacy Cahoon. Three good drivers, and they all lost control, so it's obvious there's fluid down. There you see Red Mead taking it back to his pit. And that's the first caution we've had in these sportsman heats. Eight laps complete, and that looked like synchronized spinning. Absolutely. It was... Uh, yeah, no major damage, I don't think, however. Uh, no major collisions. They should be able to make repairs and get the cars back in action a little later. All right, so eight laps down. Heat number three for the sportsman. We'll come back for the finish. Motorsports Magazine from Airborne. Two laps to go in this third heat. Let's set the lineup on the inside. The 76 of Steve Rennett at Buckle Branham in the second spot. Peter Fecto sits third, Stacy Cahoon fourth. Then we go back to Doug Hoare and Robin Wood. And Steve, we haven't talked much about Robin Wood, but he joins what should be a very uh, competitive rookie class in the late model sportsman. Absolutely. Another one of the Tiger guys trying their hands at the next division up, and we wish him the best. And you know, with Buckle running this division, it could be a pretty good two car operation. They come down for the green flag. Renadette maintains his position on the inside. Buck O'Branham looks to the outside, but Renadette pulls away down the back stretch. They head into turn three. Branham, half a car length back in second. They come out of four for the white flag. Doug Hoare looks to move around Peter Fecto for the third spot as they head out of turn two. Now we go back to the front. There's the 76 of Renadette. Down for the checkers and Steve Renadette. Branham second. Doug Hoare third. Peter Fecto fourth. Stacy Cahoon fifth. And Robin Wood sixth. But a convincing victory for the 76. Second year late model sportsman competitor Steve Renadette. Yeah, Renadette, even though he was a rookie last year, did find his way to victory lane in the main event. More or less pick it up where he left off, as he has proven this is the right division for him. All right, so those are the three sportsman heats here on opening day, May 1st, 1994, at Airborne. Time for the Flying Tiger feature. More than two dozen cars in the field, and Steve Hayes, you're lucky enough to call it. Oh, thanks. About 27 machines answer the call. The only event for the Tigers here on opening day is their 20 lap main event. The honor of the pole goes to Highgate Vermont. Sparky LeMond in his 75. He is joined by the red and white 17 of Brian Bushy to complete row one. 27 machines start to gear into top speed. Green flag flies. LaPan Bushy side by side heading into one of the host of others hungry for their first victory in the first race of the year. Up front, trouble with the pole setter. Caution coming at it. If you were to look it for, you'd know why. Couple of automobiles tangle up. We have a wheel in the infield. Caution comes out of Jeff Plunkett's lead will be no longer. Plunkett started inside row two. Well, that'll all be diminished. 
One automobile retired, the 99 of street stock champ, Moon Miller. Moon making the jump up this year. Not a good start for the Moon Man. Well, Robbie, that's not the way these guys wanted to kick things off. Never got a lap in the books, and already a tiger, tire goes flying. I'm afraid the car is stuck in the mud. You know who that is? I have no idea. He's it's a be black stuck automobile. <laughs> And, of course, some of these automobiles have changed their color schemes, but... Lost a tire, and boy, with the rain that we had this morning, the infield is very wet. And he's going to be there a while. Well, several automobiles who were here last year in attendance have made their return. Among them, the Mean Green 86 machine of Tyson Drown. Drown looks very familiar like last year. Some of the other cars in this field, you may want to keep uh, an ear out for, shall we say. Gary Woods in the 53, he's starting up near the front. He probably will have a good race. And we haven't talked to him yet this season, but we will. Morseville, New York's Brad Duquette in the 18 machine. Why are we going to talk to Brad? Well, first of all, he's a pretty nice guy. But second of all, Brad recently returned from a trip down south. He attended the Richard Petty Driving School. So Duquette trying to get a little bit of an advantage on some of the Tiger competitors, Rob. Well, Steve, uh, while they get Toby Eversall, that's the driver who's stuck down in the mud, while they attempt to retrieve Toby's car from the mud here at Airborne, we'll take a break and come back with a complete restart. All set to restart the Flying Tiger feature, and once again, here's Steve Hayes. No laps officially in the record books. The whole 20 set to come at you. Two automobiles missing from the original lineup. The two cars involved, Ebersol's 82, Moon Miller's 99. Up front to restart it, the 17 of Brian Bushy, the 07 of Jeffrey Plunkett. Green flag falls, and it looked like Tyson Brown wanted to go three wide. That would not have been the smartest move with a big field behind him. Plunkett does go wide. He's opened up the group underneath him. Meanwhile, Bushy jumps out to the early lead from the pole spot. Brian Bushy with the 17, leading the 53 of Gary Wood. Then the Mean Green 86 machine of Drown, and he is followed closely by the 44 of Dave Wilcox. One automobile back to about 17, but that's where he started. It's a defending champ, Mark Lamberton with his 29 machine. Mark almost looked like, whoa, trouble up front, pluck it. Get sideways, Bob, and guess what? We have another tire come loose. Jeffrey Pluckett loses the same tire that the 82 machine of Eversol did, Rob, and I hope this is not some sort of a trend we're starting. Well, if Robbie gets a notice here, we have the tire rolling past the start-finish line, and the tire beat half the field to the line. I don't know if that's going to count. I'll tell you, I wouldn't stay in the way of that tire. <laughs> I'd say the thing is balanced. It's rolling pretty straight to me. It's going right to the pits. Yeah, it's going to go right exactly back. exactly where it's supposed to be. Look out, going downhill again, picking up steam. Unfortunately, the rest of the L7 is stuck in the mud up between three and four. Ooh, and the wall stopped it, or else a few ACT cars would have had dents. Yeah, finally, it comes to a rest. Once again, the yellow flag flies. We have one in the books, 19 to go, and the way this is starting out, this is gonna be a long one. I'm maybe glad they didn't have qualifying today. restart in the Flying Tiger heat. Steve Hayes, can we complete more than a lap? Well, if all four tires stay on the remaining cars, we might be able to. That's been the problem so far. Starting in the front row, Brian Bushy and Gary Wood to set them on their way. One down, 19 to go. Front of the field nicely bunched. Back of the field not even close. Green flag flies. Gary Wood gets a slight jump on Olsen and Bushy. Bushy with the inside for first line, however, makes it work. Opening for a crowd if he gets to the inside. No, not able to. Tyson had a shot at going three wide, backed off. Meanwhile, up front, Bushy and Gary Wood stay side by side. Looks like that second groove is getting a little slick out there. Cars coming off four, going a little closer to the wall than they would like to. 
some cards running close together in the middle of the pack. Duquette, Sawyer, Lamberton, Williams, Leo. Those guys, guys who you might figure might run close together all season long. Bushy leads it to the stripe again. Highs and ground, cuts to the outside, looking to take the top spot behind him. 49 of my bash with a 44 of Dave Wilcox. And running fifth is the 37 of Eldred Hutchins. If the car looks familiar, that's the one that Weston drove so well last year. Brian Bushy knows exactly what to do. Stay on the low side. Well, I jinxed him. I tell him to stay on the low side. He drifts high. You take a look at what's going to happen. He goes from first to third. If he doesn't fight an inside line, he's going to go back farther. Tyson Drown, your new race leader. Wilcox right on his bumper. Bowser's third. Bushy fourth. And Hutchins with the 37. Still running fifth. Then a gap of about six or seven car lengths back to a battle between Esseltine and Gary Wood. One car on the move, the 77 of High Park, Vermont's Eric Williams. He gets bumper banged by Jason Leo, that time in three. Both cars keep it heading straight, however. Eric Williams, the guy who maybe in a year or two would love to jump into the late models, had a pretty good 93 season, looking to do even better here in 94. Williams to the outside of Hutchins in the battle for fourth. Can't make it work that time. Meanwhile, up front, Wilcox still all over the back bumper of race leader Tyson Brown. Defending Flying Tiger champ Lamberton currently running eight and not making a whole lot of movement out there. May just be waiting for some openings. Lining them up this time by Brown, Wilcox, Bowser, Hutchins, Williams, Leo, Sawyer, Lamberton, Bushy, and Young. Some of these guys did not have the cars as ready as they would like. There have been several pit stops made by some of the back markers. Well, the Mean Green 86 machine is about to encounter traffic directly in front of them. The 81 of Mike Nax, the 73 of Dufresne, caution on the speedway as the 50 machine of Richard Sherman is facing the wrong way in turn two. Our third caution, we have nine down, 11 to go, and Rob, Tyson Drought is doing everything just to perfection so far. Good challenge from Dave Wilcox, who's been right on the back bumper of the 86 and Tyson Drown. But Steve, look out for Eric Williams, Jason Leo, Eldred Hutch has been in a real battle the last four or five laps with uh, Eric Williams. But those cars are slowly rising to the top of this field. Well, I'll tell you what, we're a lap short of the halfway mark. And if you want a prediction, I would say the first winner of the year in the Tigers will go to that 77 machine. Williams looks super quick out there. And if he can get to the front, I don't know if anyone's going to be able to get past them. Well, he sits fourth right now. And as you said, we're just one lap short of the halfway mark. Well, when we left for break, we told you that there were 11 laps remaining, just one short. They've switched that. Eight laps complete, 12 to go. And here to bring you the call, Steve Hayes. And they've also moved Eric Williams back a position. He'll be fifth inside of row three. Hutchins moves up to the outside of row two. And, you know, Williams may want to be on the inside row. It might be the best spot for him. Getting set for the restart. Tyson Drow taking it real slow. Dave Wilcox waiting for the leader. Now they get bunched up nicely. Good tight field coming out of four. Green flag resumes the action. And this time Wilcox gets a jump. But it's not going to be big enough. Brown powers to the inside. Will and Wilcox having to go back again. Wilcox content though to stay on that outside. Had the opening to get behind the leader. Chose not to. Laverton tried to make a move behind the leaders. He's running about eight. They got shuffled hard. A couple of cars closed the gap on him in a hurry. Up front. Ground your leader. Wilcox to his right. Door opens here. Comes by Bow. Trouble. Bowser hits the brakes hard as he was going into the side of the second place automobile. Wilcox gets a little loose that time in three. And behind him, the battle for third is Bowser and the eight of Jason Leo. Did not need to neglect Jason Leo. Leo is also running very strong. Williams still running fifth. Eric now gets the opening as he moves into fourth. 
sixth is Wild Bill Sawyer, and Mark Lambert has moved into the seventh spot. And right next to him is the 37 of Hutchins. They're all trying to catch this man in the 86 Tyson Brown. For a change, Brown does not have Wilcox all over his back bumper. Gets about a four car length lead. And Scotty Dufresne, one of our street stock guys moving up, has lost it in four. Should be no contact. They all should avoid him. Let's hope. Oh, some of those cars were awful close to catching the back end. Everybody avoids Scotty Dufresne in the 73. Brings out our fourth caution. And it looks now that maybe Tyson Drought does have the right setup, Rob. Very good restart for Tyson Drown. Wilcox tried very hard to get him on the outside, but Drown's doing a good job of just holding that inside line. He's been very tough to get around. Well, he's really going to have to earn his pay this time because in the second row in the restart, you're going to have the 8 of Leo, the 77 of Williams, and either one of those guys could make a move on the leader. You know, Mike Bushy's run very well as uh, well in the fifth spot, sitting right now in the car 49. Seven laps in the books. Steve Hayes, we'll see if Tyson Drown can hold him on. Usually, if I say someone from Moore's or Moore's Forks is leading the Tigers, you assume it's Mark Lamberton. Not today. It's Tyson Drown with the combination. Just as we were getting ready to go to green, Duke had pitted the 18 and tough break for Brad. Well, Drown's luck may have run out. Wilcox got the jump, but Wilcox goes wide. Can Drown capitalize? Wilcox slams the door and Drown. Drown punches it in the back end. Look out. Uh-oh, Tyson, that's not where the track is. You try that, you're going to have a major problem. It is Wilcox. Drown. Well, not the lock. Eric Williams has found a new gear on the outside. Williams with the 77 machine may have figured out what he needed to do. He moves past Drown for second. The only thing between Williams and the lead is the 44 of Wilcox. Drown still fighting back, not quite ready to give up the second spot, finally has to. Now Jason Leo moves to the outside of Drown. Meanwhile, Bill Sawyer sitting very comfortably in the fifth spot, waiting for someone to make a mistake. Caution on the speedway. Gary Woods has been sitting off turn two for a couple of laps. Finally bringing out the caution. So we'll have yet another caution. We'll bunch him up again, but this time, Drown did not get the start he wanted. Wilcox took the top spot, but let's admit it, Rob, on this restart, I have a feeling Eric Williams is going to take the lead. Well, we've been talking in between caution flags that Eric Williams has been probably the fastest car on the track. But give credit to Wilcox on that last restart. He was very quick, and uh, he's going to have to have more of that if he wants to hang on to the lead on this restart. Well, with about seven to go, you assume the winner will come out of the top ten. They'll be when they get ready to restart. Wilcox, Williams, Drown, Leo, Sawyer, Bushy, Lamberton, Young, Benoit, and Hutchins. You know, we haven't really mentioned the 74 of... Steve Hayes, good restart coming up. Wilcox on the inside, Williams on the outside. Hey, and row two, Drown and Leo, a couple of guys who still might find their way to the front. 13 down, 7 to go. And just think, on Saturday, August 13th, this division has 100 laps here at Airborne. I hope that doesn't take too many cautions. Wilcox, Williams, take him to the... Wilcox takes Williams a bit high. Good idea, Dave. May work. He forced Williams to get on the binders as he took the 77 machine up high out of four for the restart. Now Williams gets back into it, but not able to make... The, and again, Wilcox taking it a little high. If Tyson Drow was able to capitalize, he could make a three-wide move, which might force Williams to back off altogether. Your top five already pulling away from the guy in six, who just happens to be Mark Lamberton. Lamberton may have been playing around a little bit. He's up to sixth, and maybe he's thinking about doing some serious racing now. But it just does not seem that the 29 machine is what we're used to seeing. Five to go for Wilcox. And would it be considered a bit of an upset at the 44? Oh, William Bumper bangs a leader. Came out of two, gave Wilcox a shot. I think they knew that Eric was there already. Four 
to go for the 44. Well, Eric Williams is going to have to make a decision, inside or outside. Chooses the ladder, gets to the outside, and right in front of him is Scott Dufresne. Williams may try to use the slow, slower car of Dufresne as a pick. Let's see what happens. Oh, Wilcox is stuck behind the slow. Wilcox bags into Dufresne. Williams left, but look at Jason Leo take the leader around. Well, some people would say that Wilcox got what he deserved. I don't know, but look who the leader is. Not how we thought he would take the lead. Caution on the speedway. We have one car spun around in turn two, still in the low groove. Well, Rob, let's try to set what happened. Wilcox, the leader. Williams was sticking it behind the Scott, our slower car of Scott Dufresne. Wilcox saw what was happening, got into the back end of Scotty Dufresne, took him around, and in the ensuing melee, Jason Leo took the 44 around. <laughs> Who said we wouldn't have uh, excitement, controversy right here in the first week? Well, you know, the one guy you cannot blame there is Eric Williams. He did exactly what he should have. He went to the outside, forcing the leader to have to slow up. You can't blame Williams. He did the right thing. Wilcox got in the back of Dufresne, but then Jason Leo said, hey, there's an opening. But when he went for the hole, Wilcox tried to cover it, and that forced a 44 to go, spinning around in three. Well, on Williams' part, like you said, it's actually a pretty good strategy. He saw the uh, left car of Dufresne, and he uh, realized that both... Wilcox and himself were approaching the lap car, and he just used that as a pick. Well, that's why I mentioned going into three, it was obvious that Eric Williams saw Scott Dufresne's car, knew, hey, if I can put him, our leader behind him, I might take the lead. He had the right idea. He did what he had to do. He still got the lead, but it's not the way we thought he would. Wilcox may have a left front flat. The car is, yeah, he's got a left front flat. It's tough break for Wilcox. He had a great run going, but up front, you know, don't give this race to Williams. Jason Leo may still have an ace up his sleeve, Rob. Steve, we have a two-lap dash now for the checkers, and we'll have that when we come back. Motorsports Magazine. Getting set for the restart. Two laps to go. Well, make it three. They've just changed the scoreboard. 17 down, three to go, and what an interesting front row. Eric Williams, Jason Leo. Behind him, a couple of guys who have done all right so far, Tyson Drown, Bill Sawyer, then Mark Lambert and Mike Bushy. So there are your top six. Only 19, or uh, scratch it, 20 machines remaining so far. Even with all the cautions, we've only dropped seven from the original starters. Uh-oh, Sawyer got very loose out of four, gathered it in. And Team Cars, Benoit and Sawyer run side by side for the fifth spot. But up front, it is Williams leading Leo. Good battle for third as Lamberton ducks to the inside of Drown. Drown shuts the door that time. And they all have two to go as they hit the strike. Jason Leo has one mile to figure out how to win this race. Eric Williams pulls away as he comes out of two. Trouble on the back stretch. Sawyer looping it around several cars trying to avoid him. No caution flag. The white flag will come out. Last lap for Eric Williams. Jason Leo does not appear to be close enough to make a challenge. Mark Labrador is third, followed by Drown and Danny Benoit. And the first Flying Tiger feature victory of the 94 season goes to the Lemoyle Ambulance sponsor, 77 of Eric Williams. Jason Leo up for third. Mark Lambert, your defending champ. Or Leo second, Lambert in third. Fourth goes to Tyson Drown and fifth to Danny Benoit. We didn't mention Benoit a lot, the Tiger B champ, who admitted last year his B Tiger beat about half of the A's. But Rob, no major surprise the way Williams was running, but you know, Labberton didn't really gain 30, more or less inherited it through some attrition, but uh, your top three, three guys will probably will battle right down to the last week for the title. Williams, Leo, and Lamberton. Set for the late model feature, Glenn Wright on the pole. 
field of 25 cars set to take green. 30 laps the distance. Line right drifts high to the outside. It's the 42 of 20 Poisson as Poisson shoots in the lead.
has a half a straightaway lead over this man. like going there inside groove is entirely full of fluid so we could may have a little extended caution here as they clean that up but what about wild bill fountain he is literally running away with this event and i'll tell you what you may uh remember that he has done this in the past those gremlins crept up and took a victory away wouldn't you know we'd have a caution with three laps to go uh, the way Fountain is running this one, I uh, really don't see anybody challenging him over well, the last I'm three laps. Well, I'm thinking laps. more that something will to the car more than they, <laughs> he'll get beat by a driver. But uh, now Wild Bill definitely, shall we say, has this field well in hand. Three laps to go when we come back. Three laps to go. Let's set the field. It's Billy Fountain, the leader. The 10 is a lap car. That's Ricky LeQueer from Lashburg. Tony Poisson is second. He's had a fine run. So is Glenn Wright. Wright sits third. Jim Barton is in fourth. Tom Tiller fifth. Buck O'Brien of sixth. Danny Bridges seventh. Steve Rennett at his eighth. Scott Carpenter ninth. Brent Dragon, the last car in the top 10. The green is out. Just like that, Fountain starts to pull away as a 10 car length lead over second place car. That's the 42 of Tony Poisson. But we go back to the front where Fountain comes down. 
down to accept the white flag. From Plattsburgh, the 91 Bill Fountain, the winner. Tony Points on second. Jim Barton, third. Tom Tuller, fourth. Steve Renadat up to fifth. But the story of the late model sportsman feature, that car right there, the 91 of Bill Fountain, as he was clearly the class of the field. Well, Wild Bill kicking things off just the way any driver would want to, winning the opening day event. Billy, if that car holds together, already stabs himself pretty much as probably one of the big favorites to walk away with a 94 track championship. Well, he finished just outside of the top 10 last year in points, and he missed quite a few events. So like you say, he is definitely a serious threat to pull off the championship here in 1994, and you can't start any better than the way Bill Fountain has just started. Yeah, very good point. And convincing one, that's the thing. Very. It wasn't one of those coming out of four and making a last lap pass. He uh, he pulled away from the field, and this is a division you don't see that often. All right, we have one event yet to uh, hit the speedway, and that is the street stock feature, and you never know what's going to happen when they come out on the track. So stay with us. That'll uh, be coming up next. Street Stock feature time, and Steve Hayes has memorized everyone's name on the track and is willing to uh, show his expertise right now. If you believe that, I'll sell you some swampland in Florida. Front row, the 76, Rick Hart on the outside. A familiar looking 66, well, and the late miles is familiar. Corey Trabali piloting the car starting the outside of row one. Come down, green flag out. Corey Trombley gets the jump on Rick Hart. Tony Bressard with a 71 inside row two looking for an opening. Trombley drifts high. The white 18 of Hank Hutchins takes advantage. And three wide, make it four wide. It did. He gives with a 92 like he shot out of a can and gains about five positions on the back stretch. Hank Hutchins, your leader. Rick Hart second. Corey Trombley third. Followed by Bressard. Good three wide action behind him. Keep an eye on the 37 of Dave Parent. That machine, they looked very well last year. Four wide action. Ho, oh, have mercy, fans. Roy Ebersol's 82 has come to an abrupt halt in turn one, trying to get it off of the racing groove. Meanwhile, they stack them four wide into one. Billy Fountain won the late model race. His son Sean running fourth in this event. Scratch it fifth. Sean Fountain puts the nine away to the outside of Rick Hart. Sets up for the 66 of Corey Trombley. As caution comes out as Roy Emerson not able to take the 82 off the speedway. <laughs> Getting up with the restart, two down, 13 to go. In the front row, the 18 of Hang Hutchins. He is joined by the red, white, and blue number 29 machine of Brian Pugh. In row two, the 76 of Rick Hart and the 66 of Corey Trombley. Row three belongs to Sean Fountain and Tony Brassard. And the lead cars have about eight car lengths as the green flag falls to resume the action. That's all right. Hutchins and Pugh take them into one side by side. Behind him, Corey Trombley currently running third. 25 of the Mini Maniacs start of the main event. Action up front, the white 18 of Hutchins. The blue 29 of Brian Pugh. A big lead for those two over third place, Rick Freya with the 77 machine. Back up front, Hutchins, who got to the lead early. Trouble right in front of him. The 99 machine spun. 
evasive action as he decided to return to action right in front of the leader. It is Hutchins, five car lengths over a few. A straighter wherever Sean Fowden and Corey Trombley with Rick Trainer running fifth. Trouble again, the 99 machine gets together with the 80 and several automobile take evasive action. Also involved the 77 of Frenier. A lot of these cars not listed, so I have no idea who drive them. I did have it until I lost the sheet. But we'll get it all spread away for the next show. We have four down. 11 laps remaining in the opening event for the Mini Maniacs. And Rob, uh, this, this was not the best restart in the world. They had a big lead the front row when they got the green. Well, you're right. The rest of the pack had a long way to go to to try to catch up to the uh, two cars in the front row. We'll take a quick break while they try to figure out who belongs where, and we'll hopefully get the la next 11 laps in very quickly. It's cold up here today, Rob. We need a heater. Four down, 11 to go. Hutchins, Pew in row one. Fountain Trobley, row two. Parrot Hart, row three. Bressard and Joe Becker occupy row four. And this time, Brian Pugh gets a pretty good jump on race leader Hank Hutchins when the green flag falls. And they're not an eternity in front of the rest of the pack. Running third, Sean found thinking about splitting the two leaders. Brian Pugh was running awful deep out there. High groove finally tucked it in to avoid being a three-wide maneuver. Hutchins, your leader. Brian Pugh determined to stick with the outside groove. Sean Fountain just looking for some place to pass. Dave pairing up the fourth with Corey Trombley holding down fifth. This time Fountain has the opportunity, splits the leaders, takes care of Brian Pugh, sets his sights on the lead. Hank Hutchins has a brand new person to his right side. It's Sean Fountain with a 91 machine. Now Brian Pugh ducks out of the low group. Dave Perrin has caught up to the top three. Trobley still runs fifth with Dan Gibbs in the 92 machine up to sixth. Sean Fowl starting to pull away a little bit now as Brian Pugh passes touches in the battle for second. Some of the best action a little deeper into the pack as several cars thinking about three wide maneuvers. A lot of slipping and sliding going on out there, but most of these guys keeping the cars heading straight. In the battle for third, Dave Perry gets to the inside of Hutch and turns them around a little bit as they all get the halfway markers. It is about Q, maybe 10 car lengths in front of Hank Hutchins, followed by Dave Perry, Rick Frenier, and Dan Gibbs. Now Brian Pugh reeling in leader Fountain. One automobile to zero. Parked off a of turn three. That will bring out another caution. Not what I wanted to see, I assure you. And Rob, Sean Fountain gets to the front. Is it too early to say like father, like son? It's a good day if your last name is Fountain, apparently. Seems to be. With the wind chill about 24 degrees, Steve Hayes is set to call the finish of this race. Once again, the front row gets a big jump by the rest of the pack. Sean Fountain and Brian Pugh receive the green. Uh. It is Shodman Pugh, then Hutchins, Parrott, and Frenier. The names remain the same, just the positions seem to alter. This upcoming Saturday, regular Saturday night event here at the Speedway, but in a couple of weeks on May 14th, a regional qualifier for the late models. Special starting time of 6 o'clock. You may want to remember that. No fans, these guys are not going to go 100 laps. There's not enough time left in the racing season. Sean found opens it over Brian Pugh. That's all the 29 machine needed. They drag race to the stripe side by side, door panel to door panel, but as they get into one, 
you see what kind of an advantage having the inside groove really is. Hutchins still third, Freya fourth. Once again, the orange and white 92 machine that Dan Gibbs making things work. He's worked up to fifth. Eleven down, only four remaining. Brian Pugh catching up to the slower 75 machine. Sean found no opportunity to use the 75 as a pick. Meanwhile, Rick Frey has got himself into third, but he has a host of cars behind him. One of the quickest cars on the speedway may be Dan Gibbs, who slides into third, but with only a couple of laps to go, he has no opportunity whatsoever to get the two leaders. Two to go for Pew this time by. Sean Found is back some maybe nine or ten car lengths. And Dan Gibbs is back a good perhaps 20 to Pew, uh, to Found. White flag, last lap of opening day here at Airborne. And if you're on top of the tower, you would be adding thankfully to that sentence. Brian Pugh looking to win the opening day event. Looks like he will do just that. One set of, one set of turns to negotiate. And a three out of four. Checker flag falls on the 29 machine of Brian Pugh. Second to the 91 of Sean Felton. Dan Gibbs caught up a ton. He was back some maybe 20 to 25 car lengths with two to go. He was only back about five to Sean Fountain with a checker foul. Gibbs third, Hank Hutchins fourth, and Rick Frayer rounds out the top five. Steve Hayes, that'll wrap up our coverage of opening day here at Airborne International Raceway. And we have spinning pirouettes in turn one. And uh, overall, an interesting afternoon. We saw Billy Fountain just about wire the uh, late model sportsman feature. He looks like he's gonna be real tough this year. That car stays like it was today. I don't see anybody having anything to compete with a 91 machine this year. Flying Tiger feature, Eric Williams from uh, Hyde Park, Vermont with a strong run. Because he looks to be a uh, pretty competitive uh, Flying Tiger car this season. Aided Jason Lee around with him. Surprise, Mark Laverton didn't have quite the setup he was hoping for, but I guarantee you that 29 machine will be dialed in for next time. And of course we can't show you any of the uh, American Canadian Tour action, but uh, Ralph Mason with a convincing win. Rapid Ralph got the job done, but I'll tell you, he didn't have an easy time doing it. A lot of drivers took a stab at him, but when it was all said, Nacy picked up the win. Bill Zardo Sr. with second spot and a good run for third for the Harmon Beaver Dragon Machine. One quick explanation. Uh, again, we'll be bringing you highlights this year from Airborne. Not allowed to uh, show you the events in their entirety. Uh, so basically what you'll be seeing for racing action is uh, just three, four, five laps out of uh, out of heats or features. But we do film everything, so if any incidents or accidents occur on the speedway, we should have some sort of coverage for you, so hopefully. don't worry about that. Yeah, hopefully. It always seems we're in turn two when the accident happens in turn four. Well, I'm cold. I don't know about you. Cold? I passed cold about an hour and a half ago. All right, then it's time to wrap up the show. We hope you enjoyed the uh, first week of action here from Airborne, and we remind everyone that uh, Saturday, I believe that is, uh, what, May 7th? May 7th. Saturday, May 7th, the regular night of Saturday night racing action, and hopefully we'll have some uh, temperatures which will not make us feel like icicles. We will try to have thought out by then. All right, for Steve Hayes, I'm Rob Doles. Hope you enjoyed tonight's coverage from Airborne International Raceway, and we look forward to seeing you all season long from Airborne. Have a good night, everybody. Have a nice round of applause for your third place.